Chapter 21. What? I suddenly have two more fathers? That makes sense, Blake agreed with Dumbledore's statement, but he couldn't shake off the feeling that there was more to it. The place had been abandoned, and so had he, left uncared for decades. Yet, eleven years ago, someone had suddenly remembered him. The reason behind this sudden remembrance was a mystery to him. However, Blake's thoughts soon shifted to something even more astonishing. He looked at Dumbledore, his words slow and deliberate. So, strictly speaking, he began, pausing as if searching for the right words, the two of you could be considered my. He trailed off, but the implication was clear. Dumbledore understood immediately. The idea that he and Grindelwald, with their combined age nearing 200 years, could suddenly have a son was ludicrous. Yet the undeniable truth was that Blake shared their blood. This connection made Blake a direct descendant of both him and Grindelwald. The Phoenix Fox's recognition of Blake as a Dumbledore was proof enough, especially given its reaction to Blake's distress. Dumbledore couldn't help but facepalm at the thought. Regardless of Blake's origins as Grindelwald's experimental subject, Dumbledore had already accepted him as a member of the Dumbledore family. He resolved to guide Blake towards becoming not just a good person, but an outstanding wizard. Despite the connection to Grindelwald, Dumbledore was determined to keep Blake away from him. You have the blood of the Dumbledore family in your veins, Dumbledore said earnestly. I hope you can consider rejoining the Dumbledore family, but the choice is yours. Blake met Dumbledore's sincere gaze and after a moment replied, I'm sorry, Professor. I need to think about it. Hearing Blake address him as Professor dimmed Dumbledore's spirits slightly. He had longed for a family connection, especially after the tragic loss of his sister Ariana. His brother had become a stranger to him, leaving Dumbledore to endure a long period devoid of familial warmth. Blake's emergence as a Dumbledore offered a glimmer of hope to fill that void. You should take your time to think, Dumbledore said softly. You've grown up here, and Lady Marion has been very kind to you. I understand it's not an easy decision. Regardless of your choice, I won't force you. Just remember, don't reveal your connection to Grindelwald. Given his history, which you're aware of, it's best to avoid the animosity associated with his name. Blake nodded. I understand, Professor. Dumbledore's visit had lasted from afternoon until the sky was studded with stars. Blake found it odd that Madame Marion had allowed Dumbledore, a stranger, to spend hours alone with him without interruption. Initially, Blake suspected Dumbledore might have used a spell, but seeing Madame Marion calmly waiting in the dining hall dispelled that notion. Are you done talking? Come and eat, Madame Marion invited, gesturing towards the table set with salmon soup and Blake's favorite spaghetti. It might not be as delicious as yours, but... As Madame Marion rose to greet him, Blake realized the depth of care and normalcy his life here offered, adding another layer of complexity to his decision. The lid was lifted, revealing the food inside, still steaming hot. Blake noticed something off about Madame Marion. Her voice was unusually nasal, as if she had been crying. Eat, you must be hungry, she urged. Okay. Blake replied, picking up the fork to start on the pasta. Madame Marion, clutching her handkerchief, watched him with a look of unease. Finally, she broke the silence. The elderly man who visited you this afternoon, he's a relative of yours, isn't he? Blake choked on his food at her question. Why would you think that? He managed to ask, coughing. Madame Marion sighed deeply. I've been running this orphanage for many years. I've learned to notice things. That man and you share the same striking azure eyes. Blake fell silent, not knowing how to respond. So, it's time for you to leave us, isn't it? Madame Marion concluded softly. I don't necessarily have to leave, Blake said, his voice tinged with sadness. This is a positive development, my dear boy. I may not know why you were left here, but I've always hoped that our children would find families of their own one day. To have a home, orphans without anyone to turn to are truly too pitiful. Later that night, in the woods outside the orphanage, Blake watched as the large brown bear he had befriended eagerly devoured the salmon he had brought. It seemed the bear hadn't managed to catch anything on its own. Without Blake's intervention, it might have starved. From now on, you'll be called Big Bear, Blake declared suddenly. Big Bear responded with a few sounds before stuffing another fish into its mouth. 
Blake, understanding the bear, chuckled. Just because you're named Big Bear doesn't mean you'll have a sibling named Second Bear. Big Bear seemed to ponder this for a moment before Blake suggested, How about Xiong 3? You should focus on your meal, Blake said, watching Big Bear continue to eat. Reflecting on Madame Marion's words, Blake realized she knew about Dumbledore's visit and suspected he was there to take Blake back to his family. She supported this idea, understanding the importance of a home for an orphan. Perhaps it was indeed time to consider leaving with Dumbledore. Blake hadn't expressed a desire for a family. He saw nothing wrong with being an orphan. Yet, he couldn't help but think about the future. Leaving with Dumbledore meant having a powerful figure to support him. He mused, It seems leaving with Dumbledore might be the safer choice if I want to avoid trouble in the future. Chapter 22 The Unusual Siberian Hamster For many days after Blake's test, his emotional treasure chest system had revealed that anger was the most frequently dropped emotion and the easiest to trigger. Shock and other emotions followed closely behind. This meant that, for the sake of rewards and becoming stronger, Blake might find himself engaging in more thrilling activities in the future. He reasoned that dancing in minefields would be inevitable, embracing the philosophy that death is like the wind, always by my side. However, Blake was comforted by the thought that as long as Dumbledore was supporting him and he didn't push the boundaries too far, he wouldn't find himself in mortal danger. In fact, making Dumbledore angry could even work to his advantage, as it would likely increase the drop rate of the treasure chests. While it might seem somewhat reprehensible, Blake justified his actions with the simple desire to grow stronger. With this mindset, Blake had resolved to take bold steps forward. Blake's belongings were few, as he had distributed most of his possessions to the other children. Holding a small suitcase, he looked around the small room that had been his home for years, feeling a pang of reluctance to leave. Madame Marion stood at the door, her eyes brimming with tears as she silently watched the boy she had cared for. Madame Marion, don't be sad. I promise to visit often, Blake said, setting down his suitcase to embrace her warmly. I've heard your relative is a professor. I believe your future will be brighter, Madame Marion said, trying to smile through her tears. Blake smiled back, knowing that the professor she imagined was quite different from the reality. After bidding farewell to Madame Marion and the other children, who watched him with heavy hearts, Blake approached the door where Dumbledore was already waiting for him. Goodbye, everyone. I'll make sure to visit, Blake called out, before he and Dumbledore walked away. They continued until Madame Marion and the children were no longer in sight. All right, grab my hand. We'll use Phantom Shift to leave, Dumbledore instructed, explaining the spell to Blake, who marveled at the magic. However, Professor, I just remembered I forgot to bring my pet. It'll go hungry without me, Blake suddenly said. Oh, what pet? Where is it? Dumbledore inquired, intrigued. In that forest over there. It's a Siberian hamster, Blake replied, pointing towards the woods. After a short walk, Dumbledore was taken aback by the sight of a large brown bear, far from the small creature he had expected. This is the Siberian hamster you mentioned? He asked incredulously, staring at the bear that weighed at least five or six hundred pounds. At that moment, Blake was gently stroking the bear's head, calming the normally ferocious beast with ease. Dumbledore watched in astonishment, half-jokingly wondering if Grindelwald had experimented with Newt's blood to achieve such docility. Ding! Detected emotions of shock, the system announced, rewarding Blake with a silver treasure chest for successfully surprising Dumbledore. Blake's lips curled into a smile, pleased with the outcome, though he had hoped for a higher-level chest. Dumbledore, still processing the sight, considered the practicalities of caring for such a large animal and the complexities of using phantom shift with it. However, seeing Blake's bond with the bear, he remained open-minded about the possibilities. With the sight of joy in Blake's eyes, the initial hesitation vanished. After all, it was just a bear, and if Blake was fond of it, then they would find a way to keep it. Professor, is there a way to bring it with us? Blake inquired, hope flickering in his eyes. Absolutely not. No, wait. Of course, there is a way. Dumbledore corrected himself with a smile that hinted at a solution. May I borrow your suitcase? 
Sure, Blake responded, handing over his suitcase to Dumbledore. Dumbledore placed the suitcase on a large rock, removed the few pieces of clothing inside, and set the fup em aside. He then took out his old wand. Without uttering a single spell, a special kind of spatial distortion seemed to envelop the suitcase. There we go, Dumbledore said as he closed the suitcase and handed it back to Blake. Just face it and open the lid whenever you want to put the bear inside. The space is ample, it won't feel cramped. Blake accepted the suitcase, his surprise evident. Dumbledore had transformed his ordinary suitcase into a magical container capable of holding magical creatures. Turning to the bear, Blake gently patted its head and whispered a few words into its ear before opening the suitcase. In the next moment, the bear was seamlessly drawn into the suitcase without any resistance. Now, we can depart. Once we arrive at our new home, we'll let it out, Dumbledore announced. He then conjured a piece of cloth into a small bag and placed Blake's clothes inside. After settling in and getting acquainted with our surroundings, we'll head to Diagon Alley. It's time for you to buy your school supplies. And most importantly, your wand, Dumbledore added with a twinkle in his eye. I won't hand you the admission letter directly. It will be sent to you by Owl. I wouldn't want to spoil the tradition of receiving your Hogwarts letter. At the mention of Diagon Alley, Blake's eyes sparkled with excitement. The prospect of finally visiting Diagon Alley and obtaining his own magic wand thrilled him. Having always cast spells without a wand, Blake was eager to experience the sensation of wielding one. Moreover, Diagon Alley would offer him the chance to purchase the books he desired on transfiguration, alchemy, and ancient runes, allowing him to meticulously plan his studies. P.S. Dear readers, the increase in monthly votes has been slow, and the numbers are disheartening. I've even resorted to casting three votes for myself in secret. It's a pitiful situation, and I'm earnestly requesting your monthly votes. Once the votes are in, I promise to remain dedicated to delivering the story. Additionally, the next chapter will take us to Diagon Alley. It seems that wherever our protagonist goes, excitement is sure to follow. And of course, new characters, including girls, will make their appearance. Chapter 23, An Old Friend Revisited In the quaint town of Godric's Valley, Dumbledore's gaze lingered on the familiar sights, each corner brimming with memories of days long past. Nearby, Blake leaned against a wall, trying to steady his churning stomach. The discomfort from the phantom shift was unsettling, akin to the carsickness muggles often experienced. Professor Dumbledore a middle-aged man approached with a brisk pace, his face unfamiliar to Blake. Mr. Pierre, Dumbledore greeted warmly as Mr. Pierre eagerly shook his hand, a bunch of keys in the other. We've completed the tasks you assigned. Here are the keys. Thank you, Mr. Pierre. Your efficiency remains unparalleled, Dumbledore expressed his gratitude, receiving the keys with a nod. Flattered by the compliment, Mr. Pierre beamed. It's my pleasure, Professor Dumbledore. Should you require assistance in the future, do not hesitate to call upon me. With a final look of admiration towards Dumbledore, Mr. Pierre departed, barely acknowledging Blake's presence. That gentleman seems to be quite the admirer of yours, Blake remarked, joining Dumbledore with his suitcase in tow. Dumbledore chuckled softly. In muggle terms, one might say he's a super fan, though I believe he simply appreciates some of my endeavors. With the keys now in hand, Dumbledore announced, the new house is ready. To be precise, it's my ancestral home, though it's been many years since my last visit. He explained that he had enlisted Mr. Pierre and his team for renovations, leading Blake to the edge of town where the house stood. It was a modest two-story dwelling with a barren garden in front and a lush hill behind, the structure seemingly embracing the natural slope. Blake was immediately taken by the scent of the woods, envisioning the potential of the small garden for cultivating exotic plants. The mixed community of half-wizards and half-muggles, coupled with the common practice of casting muggle-repelling charms, offered a discreet environment for his botanical and magical animal endeavors. After settling in and releasing Big Bear, Blake's curiosity shifted towards Diagon Alley, eager to explore the wizarding world's commercial heart. Initially, I plan to introduce you to the neighbors, but it seems Diagon Alley calls to you, Dumbledore noted, sensing Blake's excitement. Opting for phantom shift over traditional means, they arrived at Diagon Alley's entrance, 
bypassing the leaky cauldron. The initial disorientation from the teleportation faded, leaving Blake in awe of the cobblestone street and the bustling atmosphere. Pointing to a stack of crucibles outside a shop, Blake inquired about their use. Dumbledore explained their role in potion making, amused by Blake's suggestion of using one for a hot pot. It's certainly possible, though unconventional. We could experiment with that idea, Dumbledore mused, embracing the novelty of the concept. Diagon Alley, with its wide array of shops and lively crowd, was more expansive and vibrant than Blake had imagined. The adventure was just beginning. Indeed, what you're most eager for is to obtain a magic wand, isn't it? Dumbledore said, leading the way as Blake followed closely behind. It was his first venture into the cobblestone streets of Diagon Alley, and he was captivated by the array of peculiar shops lining the path. Unfamiliar with their wares, Blake, maintaining the guise of a muggle-born child, peppered Dumbledore with a series of curious inquiries, some of which were quite unconventional. For instance, dragon's liver, 16 sickles for an ounce? How much does one sickle equate to? Can dragon's liver be cooked? Blake asked. His curiosity peaked. And why is there such a crowd around a broom? Don't they have brooms for sweeping floors at home? He continued, puzzled. Despite the odd nature of Blake's questions, Dumbledore answered each with patience and grace. Before long, they reached their destination, a shop that stood out from the rest due to its modest and somewhat dilapidated appearance. The gold lettering on the door, now flaking, read, Ollivander, makers of fine wands since 382 BC. Inside the window, a solitary wand rested on a faded purple cushion, beckoning them inside. Let's go in, Dumbledore suggested, a smile playing on his lips. Blake, filled with anticipation, followed him into the shop. Upon entering, they were greeted by the voice of a young girl dressed in green, her long blonde hair flowing down her back. A look of innate arrogance marked her pretty face as she recognized Dumbledore. Professor Dumbledore? And who might this boy be? She inquired, her interest clearly piqued by the sight of Dumbledore personally escorting a student to purchase school supplies in Diagon Alley. Inside, the renowned wand shop was surprisingly small, with only a bench tucked into one corner and nothing else. Behind the tall counter, thousands of narrow boxes, each containing a magic wand, were stacked from floor to ceiling, all covered in a thin layer of dust. Blake wondered if the dust was intentionally left undisturbed by Ollivander to lend the shop an air of antiquity. Oh, Professor Dumbledore, what a rare visitor, exclaimed Ollivander, emerging from the back. The wand maker, a slender, elderly man with unkempt hair and striking silver-white eyes, left a lasting impression. I recall that your wand was crafted by my grandfather. A fine wand indeed, though I'm sure you no longer use it, correct? Good afternoon, Garrick, Dumbledore greeted, pushing Blake forward. I'm here to purchase a wand for this young man. He is the grandson of an old friend of mine, Blake Green. Dumbledore chose not to use his own surname for Blake likely to avoid the complications of explaining the sudden appearance of a Dumbledore descendant. The surname Grindelwald was, of course, out of the question. Thus, he settled on Green and planned to introduce Blake as the grandson of an old friend. However, appearances can be telling, especially to someone as experienced as Ollivander, who had encountered countless individuals over the years. His gaze shifted between Dumbledore and Blake, a hint of suspicion in his eyes. The old friend you're referring to wouldn't happen to be yourself, would it? Ollivander asked, his tone laced with curiosity. Chapter 24. Ollivander's Discovery The silence that followed Ollivander's outburst was palpable, and he immediately regretted his words. Revealing secrets that others chose to keep hidden was a delicate matter, and he feared he had treaded too carelessly. However, the tension was soon broken by the sound of the bell at the door, signaling a new arrival and dissipating the awkward atmosphere. Ahem, miss, please wait a moment. Ollivander addressed the young lady in the green dress who had just entered. I must first attend to Mr. Green, who arrived before you. He then offered an apologetic glance towards Dumbledore, who responded with a subtle nod, indicating his understanding and patience. Blake, meanwhile, had taken notice of the newcomer. Despite not understanding why she was present in this era, he was intrigued. To him, she represented an unexpected opportunity, a potential ally or resource in this unfamiliar world. 
Turning his attention back to the task at hand, Ollivander asked Blake, Which hand do you use, Mr. Green? Blake, tempted to boast about his ambidexterity, decided honesty was the best approach in this case. Right hand, he replied, hoping to find the wand that would suit him best. Ollivander made a note of this and proceeded with a series of measurements that seemed almost comically thorough, from the length of Blake's arm to the spacing between his nostrils. Once satisfied, Ollivander moved to the shelves lined with thousands of wands, each waiting for its perfect match. Returning with a stack of boxes, Ollivander's excitement was palpable. He seemed to relish this moment, the anticipation of matching a wizard with their ideal wand. It was a process he found deeply fulfilling, akin to a parent witnessing their child's first steps. Your compatibility seems broad. Let's try this one, Ollivander suggested, selecting a wand from the pile. He presented it to Blake. Yellow sen wood, unicorn hair, twelve and a quarter inches, very elastic. Blake, feeling a mix of excitement and reverence, took the wand. It was his first time holding one, and the sensation was unlike anything he had experienced. The wand felt like an extension of himself, a conduit through which his magical power could flow more freely. Seems quite suitable. Why don't you give it a wave? Ollivander encouraged, his voice tinged with anticipation. As Blake waved the wand, a gentle breeze filled the shop, a tangible sign of the wand's compatibility with its new owner. Excellent. This is a perfect match, Ollivander exclaimed, his eyes gleaming with the satisfaction of a job well done. The successful pairing of a wizard and their wand was always a moment of joy for him, a confirmation of his skill and intuition. Blake, too, felt a profound connection to his new wand. It was as if his magical abilities had been amplified, his potential unlocked. The sensation was exhilarating, a promise of the adventures and challenges that lay ahead. With the wand selection complete, Ollivander turned his attention back to the young lady in green, ready to assist her in finding her perfect match. Meanwhile, Blake couldn't help but feel a sense of anticipation about the journey that awaited him, armed now with a wand that felt like it was truly his own. The dust, stirred into life by a gentle breeze, transformed into a drizzle that danced its way to the ground. Ah, I knew it. You're very suitable for this. Ollivander's words hung unfinished in the air as the next moment was punctuated by a loud bang. The wand in Blake's grasp had exploded, its tip now resembling the bloom of a trumpet flower. Blake stared at the remnants of the wand, speechless, while an awkward silence enveloped the shop once more. Ding! Three types of shock have been detected. Ding! Currently drawing treasure chests for the host. Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining three silver treasure chests. Blake was well aware of the origin of these three treasure chests. He stole a glance at Ollivander, who was visibly dumbfounded. That, ahem, do I need to tough compensate for this? Blake ventured after a moment. Ollivander, snapping back to reality, hurriedly dismissed the idea. Oh, of course not, my child. In fact, this is my oversight. It wouldn't be fair to make a customer bear the loss. Typically, a wand explosion occurred only if the wrong wand was chosen, a rare event that, until now, had been purely theoretical. The Ollivander family, with their long history in the wand-making business, had never encountered a wand self-destructing during a fitting. At worst, an unsuitable match might result in some minor property damage. Taking the damaged wand from Blake, Ollivander resolved to examine it later, convinced this was an isolated incident. He then presented a second wand, mahogany wood, dragon heartstring core, 11 inches, very flexible. This wand is particularly suited for transformation spells. Ollivander cast a meaningful look at Dumbledore, hinting at the renowned talent for transformation within the Dumbledore family. This time, he was sure of the match. Blake, feeling a connection with the new wand, pointed it at a box on the table. Instantly, the box morphed into a lifelike white pigeon that took flight, leaving those present in awe. Oh, what a remarkable transformation spell! Ollivander exclaimed, having never witnessed such prowess in a wizard so young. Dumbledore, wearing a proud smile, was not surprised by Blake's skill. As expected of, Ollivander began, turning to Dumbledore, who suddenly coughed, prompting Ollivander to halt his words abruptly. Ding! Two strong emotions of shock have been detected. Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining two gold treasure chests. 
The two gold chests were thanks to Ollivander and a little girl in a green dress, who watched Blake with wide, emerald green eyes filled with disbelief. It seems this wand is a perfect match. Ollivander began, only to be cut off by another bang. The wand had exploded again. I don't believe it, Ollivander exclaimed, his pride wounded. Let's try another. The reputation of his shop was at stake, and he couldn't allow these failures to continue. Thus, for the next ten minutes, the sounds of explosions were a constant backdrop to the passersby outside Ollivander's shop. Why don't I try a different one? Blake suggested timidly, looking at the table through his fingers. Ollivander, face pale, leapt up. No, I beg you, don't try any more. Perhaps you should visit another maker. The Grigovich family in Germany is quite reputable. Chapter 25 Unconvinced Cassandra He is better than me? Impossible. Cassandra's beautiful, large green eyes widened in shock as she observed the scene before her. Mr. Ollivander, a wand maker of world renown, ranked among the top three globally, arguably even the best, was visibly stumped by the boy before him. To Cassandra, witnessing a master of Ollivander's caliber nearly at his wit's end was utterly inconceivable. Pride had always been Cassandra's companion from a young age. In every aspect, her talents shone brighter than those of her peers, setting her apart and inevitably isolating her. The prospect of attending Hogwarts that year kindled a hope within her, the hope of finding a worthy adversary among her schoolmates. Her curiosity had been piqued when she saw Professor Dumbledore, a wizard of immense power and fame, personally escorting a boy through Diagon Alley. What made this boy so special that he warranted the attention of Dumbledore himself? Could he possibly be the opponent she had been longing for? Following Blake and Dumbledore into the wand shop, Cassandra witnessed something she had never seen or heard of before, Blake causing a wand to explode. Despite her worldly experiences and her family's long history, this was new to her, and it intrigued her deeply. Her astonishment only grew when Blake, with his second wand attempt, transformed a box into a lifelike white dove. Cassandra, despite her prowess, knew she couldn't achieve such a feat. She recalled how, under her parents' strict tutelage, it had taken her a week to turn a match into a perfect silver needle using her mother's wand, a feat that had astounded her parents, given her young age and limited magical power. Yet here was a boy, roughly her age, effortlessly performing transfiguration she deemed impossible. For the first time in her life, Cassandra felt bested by someone her own age. A mix of shock and a budding rivalry took root in her heart. She begrudgingly acknowledged his skill, but was quick to rationalize her feelings. I admit you have the potential to be my rival, she thought, her pride wounded. But if I had a mentor like Professor Dumbledore, I could do it too. Meanwhile, Blake, aware of Cassandra's mixed emotions, noticed her reaction. Before he could ponder further, the system chimed in, rewarding him with a gold treasure chest, followed by a diamond one, thanks to the intense emotions his actions had elicited from Cassandra and Mr. Ollivander. Although pleased with the rewards, Blake couldn't fully enjoy the moment. Seeing Mr. Ollivander's disheartened expression, who had inadvertently contributed to the diamond treasure chest, left Blake with a bittersweet feeling. The wand shop was vast, filled with countless options, yet not a single wand seemed suitable for him. It was a disappointing realization that he wouldn't be able to purchase a new wand that day. Moreover, the day had turned out to be quite unfortunate for Garrick Ollivander, the shop's owner, though the mishap wasn't intentional. Dumbledore, feeling responsible, addressed Ollivander. I'm sorry, Garrick. I'll compensate you for today's losses. He then took out a money bag and placed it gently on the counter. The damage was significant. More than 80 wands had exploded, resulting in a loss of over 500 gold galleons, considering each wand cost about seven galleons. Dumbledore was puzzled by the day's events, but suspected it had something to do with Blake's unique background. Being a new life form, cultivated in a petri dish, Blake was no ordinary wizard, and that difference might have contributed to the incident. Don't worry, Blake. As for the wand, I'll think of a way. Dumbledore reassured him, understanding the deep yearning a young wizard has for their wand and the disappointment of not being able to acquire one. Just as Dumbledore was about to lead Blake away, Ollivander, with a look of determination, stopped them. I'm not short of money, Albus, 
although Mr. Grimm blew up so many of my wands, you've brought me an unprecedented challenge. I says him, couldn't shy away from it, Ollivander declared, his earlier consideration of sending Blake to Germany for a wand now seeming cowardly to him. As the world's top wand master, he couldn't admit defeat so easily. Mr. Grimm, Ollivander approached Blake, gripping his arm. Clearly there's no wand in the shop that suits you at the moment. Therefore, I'm going to craft a wand specifically for you. Blake, taken aback by Ollivander's bloodshot eyes and the offer, hesitated. He had caused the destruction of over 80 wands, yet Ollivander was refusing compensation and instead offering to make a custom wand for him. Please don't reject this offer, Mr. Grimm. I assure you, if I can't solve this problem, no other wand maker will be able to either. Moreover, I see this as a fantastic opportunity to advance my craft, Ollivander passionately explained, his fervor making him seem almost mad. Blake, realizing the importance of having a wand and touched by Ollivander's dedication, agreed, Okay, I accept. Ollivander's response was to envelop Blake in a grateful embrace, a gesture that left Cassandra, who was observing from the side, utterly bewildered. They're about to blow up your store, and you're thanking him, she thought, unable to comprehend Ollivander's enthusiasm in the face of such chaos. Chapter 26 Blake's Sister were you outdone by me before I even made a move? In order to truly craft a wand that suits you perfectly, I may need you to visit once a day for the next two days, Mr. Ollivander said with palpable excitement. This will allow me to adjust certain parameters as needed. It had been years since he felt this motivated, the last time being when he completed a challenging task set by his father. Dumbledore, observing the interaction, did not object. If Ollivander could resolve this issue, it would indeed save him a considerable amount of trouble. He picked up a wand that had been destroyed by Blake, examining it closely. Although wand lore was not his primary field of study, its connection to alchemy enabled him to quickly decipher the underlying issues. Setting aside the damaged wand, Dumbledore glanced at Blake, a flicker of surprise in his eyes. The wands had been destroyed by an immense amount of magical power. Could it be that Blake, still a child, possessed more magical power than an adult adept? Dumbledore couldn't help but wonder about the boy's potential as he grew older. A trace of fear crept into his heart. If the experiment from years ago had succeeded, this child, inheriting both his and Grindelwald's talents, would undoubtedly have become Grindelwald's most formidable weapon. Mr. Grimm, could you describe how you felt when you held the wand? Ollivander asked, Setting aside a book and picking up a quill, his gaze fixed on Blake with serious interest. Well, when I first held the wand, I felt a strong urge to cast a spell, Blake began, recalling the sensation. And after casting, it felt incredibly satisfying, like releasing a surplus of energy. He smiled, though the feeling had been short-lived due to the wand's destruction. Upon hearing Blake's description, Ollivander set the book aside and picked up a damaged wand, examining it closely. His expression turned to one of shock. He had harbored doubts upon hearing Blake's initial explanation, but now, after a thorough examination of the wand, he confirmed his suspicions. Blake then heard the system prompt again, indicating that no more treasure chests would drop from the target for the day. He sighed, pondering why Ollivander had only dropped three treasure chests before reaching the quota. Realizing the significance of the diamond treasure chest Ollivander had dropped, Blake understood that the quality of the treasure chest affected the quota. Higher quality chests took up more space, and thus, the quota was reached sooner. Hermione, in contrast, had only dropped silver and gold treasure chests, which explained the higher quantity of drops. Ollivander, unaware of Blake's thoughts, turned to Dumbledore, exclaiming, Mr. Green, you truly are an amazing genius. Dumbledore smiled, acknowledging Ollivander's realization of the problem. However, this praise irked Cassandra, who had been overlooked throughout the conversation. The term genius had always been associated with her, and she couldn't stand the thought of someone else being recognized as such. Humph, is it just because his transformation skill is better than mine? She thought bitterly. Uh, Mr. Ollivander, why are you suddenly praising me? Blake asked, genuinely puzzled. Aya, Mr. Green, can't you see how powerful your magic is? Ollivander replied, somewhat exasperated. 
The wands didn't explode because they were unsuitable for you, but rather because your magical power is so strong that it caused them to burst. Blake was taken aback by this revelation. So that was the reason behind the exploding wands? Magic wands had just been tested, and the outcome was beyond anyone's expectations. Blake had managed to overload the wands with his immense magical power, causing them to explode. Cassandra, who had been observing from behind, was taken aback. The idea that someone her age could possess such a formidable level of magic was astonishing. She had no reason to doubt Ollivander's assessment. The renowned wand maker had no cause to lie. As Blake received enough, her system prompt, congratulating him on his achievement, he could almost picture the look of shock on Cassandra's face. He mused to himself about her competitive nature, silently acknowledging her as his next challenge. Dumbledore, having observed the incident, shared his insights. Blake, your magical power is quite unique, he began, using an analogy to explain. For most, casting a spell is akin to opening a faucet to let water flow from a pool. They can control the flow precisely. But in your case, it's more like using a high-pressure water gun. Your spells are more intense and forceful. Blake was surprised, not just by the accuracy of Dumbledore's analogy, but also by his knowledge of muggle technology. Dumbledore's explanation made it clear that if Blake could learn to moderate his power, he wouldn't risk damaging his wands in the future. Cassandra, unfamiliar with the concept of a high-pressure water gun, nonetheless grasped the essence of Dumbledore's explanation. The realization that Blake had to hold back his power to prevent his wands from exploding left her in disbelief. She couldn't stand the thought of being outmatched and silently vowed not to be left behind. Despite having not yet directly interacted with Cassandra, Blake had already made a significant impact on her. The system notifications confirmed as much, indicating her fluctuating emotions and the rewards Blake had earned as a result. He couldn't help but feel a bit amused by how easily he had managed to unsettle her, even without trying. As the narrative continues, the author encourages readers to engage with the story by voting and commenting, promising that their support will lead to more frequent updates. The playful reminder not to hoard books hints at the author's commitment to delivering more exciting content. Chapter 27, Cassandra's Determination Cassandra stood quietly behind Blake, her small hands gripping her skirt tightly, betraying her inner turmoil. Despite her outward calm, Blake could sense her unease. With his beginner level of godly telekinesis, a gift from his previous newbie pack, Blake was adept at reading people. Although this skill might not work on someone as powerful as Dumbledore, it was more than enough to understand the emotions of a young girl like Cassandra. Blake found himself intrigued by Cassandra's determination. He admired her stubbornness and desire to be strong, even if it meant challenging him directly. It was a refreshing change from the usual reactions he received. As Ollivander prepared to measure Blake for a wand, Blake interjected, reminding the wand maker of Cassandra's presence. Ollivander, having been so focused on the challenge Blake presented, had momentarily forgotten about the young girl waiting her turn. Apologizing profusely, Ollivander approached Cassandra with an offer to compensate for the oversight by gifting her a wand. However, Cassandra's pride wouldn't allow her to accept such charity. She insisted on paying for her wand, surprising Ollivander with her resolve. Cassandra's request for a custom-made wand caught everyone off guard. She wanted a wand that was perfectly suited to her, just like Blake. Her determination was palpable, and her glance towards Blake carried a mix of rivalry and challenge. Blake couldn't help but compare Cassandra's fiery spirit to Hermione's. While Hermione had also faced challenges head-on, there was a certain innocence to her approach. Cassandra, on the other hand, seemed driven by a competitive edge, eager to prove herself as Blake's equal. Ollivander, recognizing Cassandra's earnest desire, agreed to her request. The atmosphere in the shop shifted as everyone prepared to witness Cassandra's journey to find her perfect wand. It was a moment of growth and ambition, a testament to the power of determination and the desire to stand on equal footing with those we admire. Cassandra, despite her usual hostility, occasionally sent Blake candy. Reflecting on her personality, Blake realized she was fiercely proud and competitive. She always desired to have what others didn't and to surpass those who did. 
Perhaps the challenges she faced today were more than she had ever encountered in her life. Upon hearing Cassandra's request for a custom-made magic wand, Ollivander looked at Blake in surprise, mistakenly thinking the request was inspired by Blake's desire for one as well. Custom-made wands, after all, were known for their superior compatibility with their owners, and it wasn't uncommon for wizards to request them. Indeed, our shop offers a custom wand-making service, Ollivander explained, though it does come at a higher price. That's not an issue. I have money, Cassandra confidently stated, pulling out a pouch filled with gold coins that jingled pleasantly. Blake could only sigh at this display of wealth. Money had never been a primary concern for him. Even during his time in the orphanage, he was relatively well off. And now, as a member of the Dumbledore family, he was far from needy. Dumbledore, having been the headmaster for many years, had accumulated wealth through his salary, book royalties, and published papers. Thus, financial worries were foreign to Blake. Ollivander, dismissing the need for excessive payment, invited Blake to participate in the measuring process for a custom wand. Come over here, and let's get your measurements. We can start crafting your wand tonight. He quickly deduced that Cassandra must be from a wealthy, pure-blood family, a status that often came with significant riches. It was an opportunity he was eager to seize. Now, if you'll come with me to register, we can begin the measurements, Ollivander directed. Albus, perhaps you and the others should take this time to purchase the remaining items on your list. It's getting late. Realizing it was nearly 4.30 p.m. and that many shops in Diagon Alley would soon close, Blake knew they had to act quickly. Ignoring Cassandra's glaring hostility, he left the wand shop with Dumbledore to continue their shopping. The one place Blake was most excited about visiting was the bookstore, hoping this time their visit would be free of incidents. P.S. Dear readers, your support through comments, votes, and reviews is immensely appreciated. Your engagement fuels the story's progress and ensures frequent updates. Let's keep the momentum going. Chapter 28 a solo adventure in Diagon Alley. Emerging from Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions, Blake made a beeline for the neighboring Flourish and Blotts bookstore. Dumbledore, watching Blake's eager stride, couldn't help but smile. It reminded him of his own youthful excitement, with the bookstore holding a special place in his heart, second only to Ollivander's. Dumbledore's gaze lingered on the young wizard, stirring a long dormant feeling within him. It was a sensation he hadn't experienced since his days before becoming headmaster, guiding young muggle-born wizards and witches into their new world. Yet, the connection he felt with Blake was different, more personal. Could it be because Blake was, in some way, family? A bittersweet smile crossed Dumbledore's face as memories of his sister, Ariana, surfaced. He imagined a life where she hadn't met her tragic end, picturing the joy of accompanying her through these very rites of passage. It was a poignant reminder of the familial bond he'd long missed. At the entrance of Flourish and Blotts, Blake's anticipation was palpable. The day was drawing to a close, and the store was quiet, the earlier bustle having subsided. Let's go in. You can pick out any books you like, Dumbledore offered generously. Their moment was interrupted by an owl, swooping down with a letter. Dumbledore caught it with surprising agility, his expression turning serious as he read the message. Blake, noticing the change, braced himself for disappointment. If it's something important, you should go, he said, understandingly. Dumbledore apologized, explaining the urgency of the matter. Blake, though slightly disappointed, was understanding. He knew of Dumbledore's responsibilities, not only to the school, but also to the wider wizarding world. The fact that Dumbledore had taken the time to help him settle in was more than he could have asked for. Here's some money for you. Dumbledore said, handing Blake a pouch. Feel free to buy whatever catches your eye. Just avoid books authored by me. We have plenty of those at home. He added instructions for Blake to find accommodation at the Leaky Cauldron, and mentioned that arrangements had been made for Blake's pet, Xiong Da, and his belongings. With a reassuring smile, Blake watched Dumbledore depart, his heart racing with the prospect of freedom. Alone in Diagon Alley, the possibilities seemed endless. He could explore to his heart's content, starting with the treasure trove of books before him. But first, he had to act quickly. The bookstore wouldn't stay open forever. 
Efficiently, Blake approached the counter, list in hand, ready to dive into the world of magic on his terms. This was the beginning of an adventure he wouldn't soon forget. Blake stepped into the store, immediately requesting the clerk's assistance in gathering all the textbooks listed for his courses. As the clerk set about the task, Blake began to explore the vast expanse of Leon Bookstore. It reminded him of the wand shop in Diagon Alley, with shelves towering almost to the ceiling, filled with an array of books that seemed to defy the ordinary. The bookstore was a treasure trove of knowledge, housing everything from massive leather-bound volumes that could cover the floor to tiny silver books no bigger than postage stamps. Some books were filled with indecipherable symbols, while others seemed completely blank. In his exploration, Blake even stumbled over an invisible book that had fallen to the ground. Despite the oddities, the majority of the books were of the more conventional sort. After some time, Blake's eyes lit up as he discovered titles that piqued his interest. Application of Advanced Transfiguration, Introduction to Ancient Runes, and Introduction to Alchemy, among others. He diligently moved his chosen books to a pile, determined to immerse himself in subjects like potions and herbology, hopeful of what rewards the future might hold. The clerk, observing Blake's enthusiasm and the growing stack of books, couldn't help but smile at the sight of such, a dedicated customer. After assisting Blake for the third or fourth time, the clerk returned to the counter with another stack of books, while Blake decided to take one more look around the store. His gaze was drawn to a book with a red cover high above him. However, as he craned his neck upwards, he failed to watch his step and tripped over something, or rather, someone. Ah! Blake exclaimed as he stumbled. Ah, sorry, he quickly apologized, realizing he had tripped over a little girl with two braids who had been engrossed in a book at the bottom shelf. His accidental misstep had not only caused him to fall, but also step on the girl's foot, leaving her on the verge of tears. Ding. Grievance detected, a voice chimed in Blake's head, followed by, Ding. Congratulations to the host for obtaining. Blake, momentarily distracted by the notifications, hurried to help the girl up. I'm so sorry. I was just trying to get a better look at that book up there and didn't see you, he explained earnestly, hoping his genuine apology would soothe her. Perhaps moved by Blake's sincerity, the girl eventually shook her head, indicating she accepted his apology. Wanting to make amends, Blake quickly added, there's a dessert shop opposite the bookstore. It was unclear whether he was suggesting they go there as a form of apology or simply sharing his excitement. The girl, shy and having spoken only a few words to Blake, her ears turning red, quickly picked up her book and hurried out the door, almost forgetting to pay for it in her haste. Blake watched her leave, feeling a mix of regret for the accident and hope that his apology had been enough. He turned back to the clerk, ready to finalize his purchase, his mind still on the vast world of magic and knowledge that awaited him. Chapter 29. A shy encounter leads to an unexpected reward. Blake swiftly settled his bill at the bookstore counter, his purchase so substantial that the store provided him with a suitcase enchanted with a traceless stretch spell to accommodate the volume of books. This kind of magic, allowed within certain specifications, was similar to the enchantments on the money bags produced by Gringotts, enabling the suitcase to hold a surprising amount of books despite its compact size. With the suitcase in hand, Blake exited the bookstore. The sky had darkened, and the bustling streets of Diagon Alley were beginning to quiet as the number of pedestrians dwindled. His first stop was Ollivander's wand shop to complete the day's data measurement, a task delayed by an unexpected interruption earlier in the afternoon. Afterward, he made his way toward the leaky cauldron, navigating the familiar path through Diagon Alley. However, upon reaching the brick wall that served as the gateway between the leaky cauldron and Diagon Alley, Blake halted, struck by a sudden realization. He knew the route from the leaky cauldron to Diagon Alley, but the reverse path eluded him. The original work had never specified the method for returning. Contemplating his next move, Blake considered using his magic-infused finger to tap the wall, lacking a wand to perform the task more traditionally. If that failed, he planned to seek advice from Mr. Ollivander. Just then, a small figure appeared beside him, a familiar face from the bookstore. 
Ah, it's you. We meet again, Blake exclaimed, recognizing the little girl. Her knowledge of the area could prove invaluable. The girl, Hannah, blushed upon seeing Blake, her voice barely above a whisper as she greeted him. Blake apologized for the earlier bookstore incident, to which Hannah shyly responded, insisting it was merely an accident. Introducing himself as Blake Green, he extended a hand in greeting. Hannah, in turn, introduced herself as Hannah Abbott, her touch light and brief, her cheeks flushing a deeper shade of red. Blake, amused by her shyness, asked if he could call her Hannah, to which she hesitantly agreed. He then inquired about the way back to the leaky cauldron, and Hannah, with her wand in hand, provided the necessary instructions. Following her guidance, Blake watched in awe as the wall shifted to reveal a doorway. Expressing his gratitude, Blake offered to treat Hannah to dinner, an invitation she declined with a level of shyness that triggered an unexpected notification in Blake's mind, a gold treasure chest reward for detecting extreme shyness. Surprised by the reward and Hannah's bashfulness, Blake respected her wishes, promising a rain check for the dinner invitation. As Hannah hurried into the leaky cauldron, Blake was left pondering his own appearance, humorously questioning whether he resembled a monstrous creature to elicit such a shy reaction. Blake rented a room at the broken cauldron bar, and after a quick meal, he retreated to his room. Setting aside the box of books he had acquired, his attention turned to the more thrilling task at hand, opening the treasure chests he had collected. As he surveyed the chests in his system space, his mood lifted significantly. Today had indeed been a fruitful day, not just in terms of quantity, but also quality. Among his haul were four silver chests, five gold chests, and one particularly enticing diamond chest. Upon seeing the chests, Blake couldn't help but draw in a sharp breath. Notably, Cassandra had contributed three of the gold chests, making Blake smile with satisfaction at her high drop rate. Old rules, system, open the treasure chests for me, starting from the lowest quality, he commanded. The system quickly complied, opening the four silver chests. To Blake's delight, each chest contained a book that could be directly learned. Elementary magic spell proficiency, elementary magic staff proficiency, elementary herbology proficiency, and elementary alchemy proficiency. Blake was particularly pleased with the books on ALK, Emmy, and Herbology, as these were areas he was keen to explore further. The magic staff proficiency was a welcome addition, though he had no plans to encroach on Ollivander's territory. As for the magic spell proficiency, it would slightly enhance his casting speed, a modest but useful improvement. Next, Blake turned his attention to the gold chests. Open the gold treasure chests, he instructed. The system announced his rewards, the highest level of magic staff proficiency talent, which made Blake chuckle at the thought of Ollivander. He then asked the system to open the remaining four gold chests simultaneously. The rewards were astonishing. The best talents in herbology, weather spell proficiency, prophecy, and cooking proficiency. Blake was overjoyed but puzzled by the prophecy talent. Could Cassandra also possess the prophecy talent? And what about my supposed Grindelwald bloodline? Why haven't I felt any prophecy talent before? He wondered. As the author of this tale, I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to my readers. Your support, through votes, comments, and encouragement, has been invaluable. This story has now surpassed 70,000 words and is at a crucial juncture. If you've enjoyed the journey so far and wish to support further, I kindly ask for your votes and feedback. Thank you for being part of this adventure. Chapter 30. The Custom Wand Package. A wand to rival the old. Blake didn't dwell too much on the prophecy talent. After all, the answers were beyond his reach at the moment. Perhaps Dumbledore could shed some light on it later. For now, he focused on the rewards he had received. Overall, they were quite impressive. The herbalism talent and the druid template seemed to be a perfect match. Blake could already envision the plants he cultivated pursuing his enemies across the globe. At this point, the wand talent and the prophecy talent were not immediately necessary for Blake. However, the weather incantation mastery and cooking mastery were right up his alley. These were skills that could be directly learned and applied. One would enhance his offensive capabilities, while the other promised to delight his palate. Considering how delectable the dishes from his intermediate cooking skill had been, 
Blake was excited to see what culinary masterpieces he could create with this top-grade cooking skill. The thought alone was enough to make him consider preparing a late-night snack. But there was something else that demanded his attention. A diamond treasure chest yet to be opened. The previous chest had yielded the druid template, leaving Blake thoroughly impressed. Now, with another diamond chest before him, anticipation bubbled within. System, open the diamond treasure chest, Blake commanded. Ding, opening the diamond treasure chest. Ding, congratulations to the host for obtaining a custom wand package. A custom wand package? Blake was momentarily taken aback, unsure if this reward could measure up to the druid template. Ding, a custom wand package has been detected. Would the host like to use it? Without a moment's hesitation, Blake chose to proceed. Yes, use it. He was curious to see what this customization entailed. Ding, customizing the wand for the host. Ding, the custom-made wand is a success. Ding, please select your preferred wand appearance. Blake pondered whether this customization was merely aesthetic. Well, if this wand can withstand my full power, then this reward might just be worthwhile, he mused. Although Ollivander had promised to craft a wand specifically for him, success was not guaranteed. Entering the customization interface, Blake found himself in a sealed space, facing the silhouette of a wand. Soon, various options appeared before him, size, shape, color, special effects, and template. As he weighed his options, a notification appeared. Ding! As long as the wand remains in the host's possession, the host can customize his wand as many times as desired. With this newfound freedom, Blake decided not to fuss over the wand's appearance. Opting for something less conspicuous, he quickly settled on a design, a 15-inch long wand as dark as night. Its pure black body and handle exuded an understated elegance. Satisfied with his choice, Blake confirmed his selection. Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining a custom-made magic wand. In an instant, Blake's consciousness returned to reality, and he saw the black wand floating before him. Taking a deep breath, he couldn't help but feel a twinge of nervousness. After all, his history with wands was tumultuous, to say the least. What if this one? Blake could hardly believe the sensation that coursed through him as he held the wand. Initially, he feared that the wand might not withstand his magical power, considering it was custom-made. However, he quickly realized he had underestimated the quality of the system's craftsmanship. The moment Blake grasped the wand, a single word dominated his thoughts. Powerful. That was his initial impression, a feeling of overwhelming strength. But as he delved deeper into this connection, he discovered something more profound, a sense of unity, as if the wand was an extension of his own body, seamlessly integrated with his blood. With a swift motion, Blake waved the wand, channeling his magic into it. To his astonishment, the wand not only withstood the surge of his potent mag, I see, but also amplified it twofold. This revelation was staggering. With this wand, Blake realized he could cast spells with double the usual power, a significant advantage in any magical confrontation. This wand, it's incredible. I wonder how it compares to my old one? Blake mused, genuinely curious. The system, usually silent, responded this time. Ding! The wand's material and core are unknown. It measures 15 inches in length and possesses exceptional flexibility. Its quality matches that of your previous wand. Blake was impressed. As expected of the system's products, he exclaimed, admiring the wand in his hands, unable to resist its allure. His thoughts then drifted to Ollivander, who was also crafting a custom wand for him. I wonder if Mr. Ollivander's creation can even compare to this, Blake pondered, his curiosity piqued. Meanwhile, in a dimly lit stone chamber, an old house elf named Gucci presented a photograph to Grindelwald. The photo, a still image from the Muggle world, captured Blake with a hint of unease in his expression. Grindelwald, examining the photo, seemed lost in thought particularly fixated on Blake's azure eyes. After a moment, he inquired about Blake's well-being, to which Gucci responded with praise for the young master's looks and talents. Grindelwald then instructed Gucci to take care of Blake, expressing concern that Dumbledore, with his myriad responsibilities, wouldn't have the time to do so. Gucci, worried about leaving Grindelwald alone, suggested her son could look after Blake instead. The next morning, Sunlight gently caressed Blake's face, rousing him from his slumber. He had fallen asleep at his desk, 
surrounded by open books. The knight had been spent customizing his wand and delving into the books he had brought home. Thanks to his exceptional academic genius and eidetic memory talents, Blake was able to quickly absorb and retain the vast amount of information, flipping through pages with unparalleled speed and comprehension.